Okay, so we had Darren's rather uh, expansive talk, I guess. There's quite a lot in there. Mine's, um, well, quite myopic. Um, <laughs> I'm, going to go, I'm going to tell you about how we reconstruct the soft tissue of one dinosaur, and that is, and not all the soft tissue, just the integument of Velociraptor. How we came to understand how Velociraptor was covered what was on top of its skin. So, we start with the fossils. Now the interesting thing about the is we've got very, very nice skeletons. Um, this one preserved actually fighting with a protoceratops there. The protoceratops got better of it though, bit its arm. Um, as you can see, really nice fossils, but there are no soft tissue impressions um, at all from Velociraptor. So, how do we do this? How do we clothes Velociraptor in the appropriate soft tissue. Well first off, and this is not done a lot of the time, is we've got to make a nice little reconstruction. We've got to make sure that all the proportions are right. And this is this is Scott Hartman explaining this very procedure to his cat apparently. <laughs> um, he's, he did the Scalita reconstructions in all yesterday's, which are all very nice, beautifully proportionally accurate, often traced from fossils. But the softer bits are actually harder, so <laughs> they require much more inference. Now to do this, pretty much our only resort is to look at the closest living relatives. Um, sorry, the closest relatives we've got. The closest living relatives of Velociraptor are birds and crocodiles. Now, you'll notice that birds and crocodiles look quite different, so <laughs> it's sort of a bit tricky. Um, the old way of doing this, the dark old days, which I'm going to call phylogenetic clumping, is we just put animals into boxes, right? So, birds. We'll put all birds in one thing, they've got feathers, good. But then, reptiles generally have scales. We'll stick dinosaurs, here's Velociraptor, in the reptiles, reconstruct it with, with scales, because it was a reptile. Um, this sort of phylogenetic clumping, sticking animals into bins and basically reconstructing them as if evolution worked in clumps has led to these sorts of reconstructions of the Velociraptor, which, that's from Jurassic Park, there's some pretty horrible models in the um, Natural History Museum here, uh, which we now know are disastrously uh, inaccurate. <laughs> so what do we do instead? Well, there's a brave new world, it's called phylogenetic bracketing. And basically what this is, is we're looking at the actual pattern of evolution, which is a tree. So these lines represent a single species evolving along. It might branch off many, many times to different sorts of animals. We can see birds and crocodiles are related. Velociraptor is related to birds. More closely related to birds than the most recent common ancestor of crocodiles and birds. But you'll notice that still leaves us, well, was it feathery or scaly? We don't really know. Now, as Darren probably has shown you, we do have lots of dinosaur and pterosaur impressions. Pterosaurs have got this weird pterosaur fuzz. Um, Hair-like structures, pretty extensive covering on their body. But for a long time, all the dinosaurs we knew had these mosaic scales, non-overlapping scales. And if you trace these down to the common ancestor, it looks like pterosaurs evolved this hairy stuff separately. And everything else was scaly, at least up until to here, when you have skin impressions from large theropods bracketing with crocodiles. It looks like all this, this line here was a scaly line. And that includes a lot of dinosaurs. But you'll notice it still doesn't inform us about Velociraptor, which is closer to birds than any of these other animals. <coughs> well, it started to fall apart, this scaly notion of dinosaurs, Sinosauropteryx, and that has these, um, what are they called? What's the actual? Fuzz? Tums? Fuzz? Integumentary structures. Yeah. <laughs> Stage one feathers. Stage one feathers, but they've got a, yeah, so they're basically branched off the bottom, aren't they? 
they, have, they don't have a tenacious branch. They don't have a central branch. They're just, they're a bit like down. And so we've got this from Sinusoropteryx, which I notice if you bring that in when it's closest, you get birds, Sinusoropteryx, trace it to their most recent common ancestor. You see that Velociraptor is actually descended from that common ancestor. And that tells us that Velociraptor is most likely either covered with these down-like hairs or real feathers. Luckily, we've got even more. This is Microraptor. It's a four-winged dinosaur. It's actually more closely related to Velociraptor than these birds. Is that correct? Is that still correct? Yeah. These things shift around. They're all pretty much the same sort of thing these days. So if you trace that down, you can see that this node, <coughs> you get modern birds and Microraptor, trace it down to this node, it looks like you've got proper feathers at this node, which means that Velociraptor inherited these feathers. So you can see that this is a much more rigorous way of giving us at least the most plausible hypothesis of what these animals were covered with than just sticking them into bins. So we can actually look at the whole tree of dinosaurs, and there's a tremendous amount of work done on this, it's called statistics, to get the tree, which is very interesting if you're into complicated statistical algorithms, um, <coughs> which basically gives us this tree. Um, and that's been improving dramatically over the last few years, which gives us this much finer grained notion of how we bracket animals where we don't have soft tissue impressions. We can see where they are on the tree and see what the most likely integumentary structure could be there. Oh, right, yes, and recently we found another one, which brings the several other discoveries that bring it, bring it even further down the tree, earlier than Velociraptor, these tenacious feathers. Recently we've had confirmation of sorts on Velociraptor skeletons. You can see these sort of nodules, and they correlate with modern birds where the feathers attach to the bone. So we came up with a bracket first. Velociraptor was clearly bracketed in this area of proper feathers. But now we've looked at the skeletons, you can actually see wings, or the rudimentary structures of wings, on the skeleton. But this was discovered after we pretty much cleaned up, cleared up the bracket. So this was not a surprise, but it is nice confirmation that this method works. So this has led to this sort of thing being replaced with that sort of thing. Velociraptor did almost certainly look pretty much like a very large, long-tailed bird. And this sort of dynamic, but um, naked Velociraptor, so you can see it, dead. <laughs> <laughs> Completely covered with feathers. Short wings, um, we probably even small wings on the hind legs. We don't know how far down they went. So, back to the tree, because this gets even more interesting. Darren showed you a couple of these things. So it looked like this was a fairly simple, simple story. We've got scales. <coughs> Pterosaurs were doing their own thing, they're weird anyway. Scale, 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 scales. Oh, okay, now we start to evolve feathers. Good, done. But, some rather surprising things have turned up in other parts of the tree. Darren showed you a slide of this earlier. This is a um, a civet saw, it's a sort of relative of the large horn dinosaurs, which had um, long bristle-like structures, almost like a porcupine on its tail. Um, and you can see, this is a long way from birds in the dinosaur family tree. This is the other side. Okay, so maybe you've got one fossil that's weird. But little um, ornithischians, even earlier in the tree, have a have shown have turned up, which have got a lot of these structures. So this is starting to look much more confusing. What was going on? What was the base state for these animals? And in fact, it looks like the whole question of what dinosaurs were covered with originally, what sort of structures were available to them, even <coughs> as far back as pterosaurs, is in confusion. We don't really know. Pterosaur hair could be the same thing as feathers. We're not really sure at this point. Um, 
obviously there's a lot of question marks. And what this leaves us is a tremendous amount of leeway when we're reconstructing dinosaurs. We don't know what they were covered with. We don't have direct fossil evidence. We've got all these structures that were clearly available to them in their phylogeny. So, yes, this is what, something we explore in all yesterdays. So you end up with little dinosaurs looking more like this than their scaly brethren. This is a little, a little heterodontosaur. This is not even, this is pretty much exactly what the fossils show now. I actually started this before they discovered that thing. I, uh, I decided I wanted to make something look like a hedgehog or a porcupine, and there you go. Confirmed by the fossils. I thought I was being crazy. <laughs> or even like this. I mean, once you start to really think about what these structures could do on animals, the sky's the limit. So yes, that's how we've ended up with dinosaurs looking rather more like this than lumbering lizards. The lumbering lizards evolve. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.